we're at Canto 32 on the floor of hell, approaching the nadir of Dante's descent. And it's very striking that Dante, the poet, begins this canto with an invocation expressing how hard it is to speak of this dark place. He says it's not a place for baby talk and to my ears that comes across in part as a warning for our age when people are very inclined to treat hell as if it is a childish place, something of the infantile imagination that somehow modern progressives have grown out of. And similarly, a more fundamentalist mindset is likely to use hell as a kind of stick to beat their enemies with or to weaponize in their culture wars, their trivial combat with their fellow human beings. But it's really striking that in the 20th, 21st century, where hell has often seemed to fall out of favour or has become this rather silly tool that people use to attack each other. You're going to hell. This kind of person is going to hell. It's in this period that we on earth have managed to build the greatest embodiments of hell that humankind has ever seen. They happened in the middle part of the 20th century. They exist still now. We've got the means and the technology to do so. So I think whilst I think there is signs of hope in hell, as we've been picking up along the way, we must still take hell immensely seriously. There's a reason why our forebears perceived this state. There's a reason why the greatest souls, the spiritual adepts of humankind like Dante, have wrestled with it so profoundly and now that we're approaching the heart of hell it's a call a moment to really try to get to grips with what that might be all about and not skate over it with a kind of trivializing mindset be that of um, the modern self-enlightened individual or the literal fundamentalist religious creature of our times. Dante begins by calling on the three heavenly ladies, those who he realised had heard him in his despair at the beginning of his journey. Our Lady Mary, St Lucia and of course Beatrice. He calls on them now to help him as they'd helped a Greek figure called Amphion. Um, Amphion was a player of the lyre and was said so to be able to charm the very rocks that he could get them to assemble the walls of Thebes. And it creates a sense of rocks and walls and fallenness now. Um, a lot of the devices, the poetic devices that Dante uses in this infernal place um, is by invoking for us um, the beauty of life to show up how that beauty has been stripped away um, down in these dark regions and so where Amphion could use music to build walls down here fallen walls trap and oppress souls there's a kind of contrast going on there's a more metaphysical aspect to this calling on heavenly powers to give him the right words because Dante lives um, before the modern sense that words might just be empty signs, before the idea known as nominalism really took hold. Nominalism is many things, but in a way it's the um, conviction that our words don't carry real soul, they don't reveal reality to us, um, they may um, amuse us, they may add colour to things, um, they may show how inventive the human mind is in itself, um, would be the modern sense. 
but there's great doubt about whether words themselves can imaginatively channel deeper aspects of reality to us. Um, Dante lives before that time, so here now he's calling on the words that might convey something of what he saw, as he puts it, that he might be able to squeeze the juice out of his experience so that we can taste some of that experience too. But he says words themselves aren't going to be enough to actually capture all that he saw down here. Um, he says they're neither crude uh, enough nor rough enough um, to capture this crude and rough state of being, which, as I think we've begun to see even in the end of Malabolge, um, is characterised in part by it's beginning to fall out of being. It's on its own kind of existential precipice. And so it's no surprise that words can't carry all that Dante sees because words themselves rely on soulfulness to really communicate to us. So they're going to fall away, they're going to drop away. And I think it also signals that Dante himself is going to come perilously close to falling away from being himself. This, in a way, is what he must risk in his descent in order to fully understand um, the complete breadth, the complete spectrum of reality. Um, he must touch base in order to ascend to heights. The action of the canto stresses this because it actually begins with Dante the Pilgrim still looking at the high wall that the giant Antaeus has carried him and Virgil over. But then he hears a voice, um, a word that can just about command his attention from this dark place, draws his mind, draws his sight towards the new vista ahead of them. Um, he's not quite sure what this vista is going to be about. Um, the voice is asking him to open his mind to a new reality. Um, and that struggle to come to terms with it is going to characterise quite a lot of this canto. The voice says to him, watch out, which of course is a watch out for what you might be about to encounter. Although in particular, the voice asks him to watch out that he doesn't trample and stamp and kick heads. Because it turns out that in this region of hell, the souls are trapped right up to their necks in the materiality of this place. You know, they've barely got their own bodies. Um, their, um, their souls are oozing away into the deadness of the place. And that means that all Dante sees are heads. And then comes one of Dante's greatest moments of revelation in the whole Divine Comedy, when he tells us that what he saw down there was an icy lake. He says it was like an infernal water, frozen, that sort of looked more like glass. Um, and it's such a big reveal because, of course, in the popular perception then and now, hell is a fiery place. Um, Dante is saying, no, that's part of the baby talk of hell. There's something far more profound about this state that he wants to share with us now. It's that souls down here are falling away from the fire, the heat, the spirit of divine life to such an extent that they only look like they're frozen. You know, fire with its own kind of life and vitality um, would um, be misleading because, of course, fire and heat rise, um, whereas these souls have precisely fallen away from the fieriness, the vitality and the vivaciousness of life. That is what their souls suffer now. Dorothy L. Sayers puts it really well in her commentary um, on this um, state, this great moment of revelation uh, that Dante gives us. And when she writes, um, beneath the clamour, beneath the monotonous circlings, beneath the fires of hell, which they have experienced higher up, here at the centre of the lost soul and the lost city, 
lie the silence and the rigidity and the eternal frozen cold. It is perhaps the greatest image in the whole inferno, a cold and cruel egotism, gradually striking inward till even the lingering passions of hatred and destruction are frozen into immobility. That is the final state of sin. You might say that reality itself has become a mirror in which these souls can only see themselves. Um, they can't see the divine light reflected off all things. They're condemned to stare at their own fate, their own entrapment, because in a way that's what they chose in life. Or you might say it's a kind of absolute zero, drawing on the modern understanding of temperature, where although there may be um, millions of degrees of heat, coldness itself falls to an absolute zero. It can't get any colder when the very atoms stand still. And that bit of physics reflects really well Dante's understanding of the relationship between good and evil, because evil is not an opposite pole to goodness. It's a falling away of goodness until there's nothing left. There's an emptiness that Dante now encounters. So he turns from the wall and begins to look out across Cocytus, as it's called, um, this infernal place of ice. And he says the souls look a bit like frogs poking their heads above the pond. Or he invokes the theme of harvest with the few um, heads of wheat um, that a peasant might try and gather as it's scattered across the fields. Um, he's using rather warm and lovely images of vitality and excess to contrast with um, the lack of life um, and the emptiness of the place down here. The first two particular souls that he encounters um, are locked together. Um, he says they're butting their heads like goats. Um, they're, um, they're, their tears form an ice that freezes on their lips, that holds them together in a kind of perverse kiss. And he learns that these are two brothers who killed each other um, in the desire to inherit their father's wealth. It gives us an early indicator of the state of these souls. Um, you know, their very individuality is now merged one into the other. There was something about not just what they did, but the passion that lay behind what they did um, that locked them together. Um, and um, even as they fell away from life um, in a kind of horrible tangle, um, that is now the state that Dante sees them in down here. They've no personal space um, in their kind of willful, neutral treachery. Um, he hears the voice again. I mean, it turns out that it's a chap called Camiccion di Pacci, and he names the two brothers that he's just seen, and then also a string of other Florentines that Dante would have known. And it creates a sense of this personal treachery um, that the souls in this particular zone of Cocytus, um, which is called Caine, after Cain, the murderer of Abel. Another individual that's named that stands out a bit for us um, on these British Isles um, is the figure of Mordred. He is, in legend, one of the Knights of the Round Table of King Arthur, and was said to have turned against Arthur um, and mortally wounded um, the great king, um, even as Arthur's lance pierced him so that you could see the sunlight through his body. Um, it's a, a rather grim image for down here of how a body has become an empty space. Um, up on earth it would have shown the sun, down here it just shows um, the frozen lake. Dante looks out a little further across it and Notes that the heads now look slightly different. They're purple with the cold. They're looking up. Um, the previous heads have been looking down in shame. And the indication is that we've already moved into another region of Cocytus, 
Um, the boundaries aren't clearly marked down here as they have been in Malabolge. Again, another sign um, that everything's blurring together as it falls away from being. Um, but this region is named um, Antenor, um, and that's after the betrayer of Troy, um, so another treacherous figure, um, but shifts attention a bit to the kind of treachery that's not just between personal relationships, like, say, the brothers, or like, say, uh, Mordred and King Arthur, um, but a more collective, social kind of treachery. To stress that Dante is becoming more deeply engaged with this zone as well, and so able to enter it more deeply. Um, it's said now that he kicks ahead. You remember that when they'd first arrived, he'd been warned about not doing so. Well, now he kicks ahead, and it's left unclear whether this is by chance or by will, by sort of divine providence, and just by carelessness, and we're not quite sure what's going on. Again, beginning to learn something, but still staying in that state of uncertainty. But it's time to gather more about what's going on, and Dante asks Virgil whether he can speak to this soul. Um, the soul has said that he was involved in the Battle of Monteperti, which is one of the set-piece battles between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. So Dante presumably feels he has some knowledge of his own that he can bring to bear in a conversation with this soul. Um, interestingly, Dan uh, Virgil doesn't actually speak in this canto. Um, it's very much led by Dante, although Dante does ask for Virgil's um, yea to do so, speak to this soul. Um, I don't know, I think maybe Virgil's silence is just a poetic way of stressing how precipitous this place is. Um, they are there together, um, but, you know, Virgil, who maybe is on the rebound from um, having got away with convincing the giant Antaeus to lower them down into the well. Um, do you remember after they got through the city of Dis, the walls of Dis, he, uh, Virgil was rather hesitant too, so maybe this is a reflection of Virgil's own state of mind. He's not quite daring to speak. Um, he doesn't quite know the words yet either. But Dante does speak to this soul, and he does learn, but he learns in a grim way, because he learns by a kind of enactment of the state of mind, the state of being of the soul that he's talking to. Um, it turns out that he's a chap called Bocca Degli Abati, and it's one of the nastiest moments in the whole of the Inferno, because Dante himself engages in one of these vicious, poetic um, combats with the soul. Um, you remember that uh, there was a kind of poetry that can aspire to greater and finer turns of phrase to capture the beauty of the divine. Well, this one is one of those spiralling ones. Um, you know, the soul says to Dante, what are you kicking at? Dante says, don't you deserve to be kicked at? Um, the soul says, you kick quite as hard as a living man, mocking Dante's um, living status, I think. And remember, Dante is quite at risk of falling out of, of life here. Um, and so the to and fro kind of goes, gets even nastier because Dante grabs um, the chap's hair, threatens to pull it out all the more and more. Um, you know, and it does raise the question, why does Dante have to undergo um, this, this trial? Why is he getting captured by it? Why is this part of the divine plan, part of the descent that can turn around into an ascent? And I think it's because he mustn't just learn about the state of his own soul, um, his own temptations, his own risks, you know, how pride and jealousy, um, uh, all those things which he's learnt about in the higher regions of hell can be his undoing. What he's now learning about is the sort of state of um, the soul of the world, if you like, and how deeply it can descend. Um, I'm drawing here a bit on the thought of the psychotherapist Donald Winnicott, who made a really interesting comment when he said that in our personal development, we need to learn 
the full ferocity of hatred in order that we can know the full power of love and how even the worst kind of hatred can't overcome love. But to really know that, to really be able to live your life from that conviction, you have to have taken the risk of experiencing that kind of hatred. Um, and I think that's partly what Dante down here is now undergoing. Um, he's being exposed to the full risk of hatred and pride and treachery and willful attack um, that takes you right to the edge of being itself in order that later on he can know that actually God's love can't be defeated by anything, even by the worst things that can possibly happen here on earth or even in the infernal regions. But right now, in this 32nd canto, it feels ugly and horrible and nasty with, you know, our kind of hero, Dante the Pilgrim, engaged in a battle that, at least momentarily, is quite as vile as the battle um, that the soul Ocker, um, that he's now tearing the hair out of, um, had lived in life, um, and which has led Bocca to be trapped in this icy desert. What happens next is that another soul calls out and names Bocca, asks what Bocca's complaining about, um, and so reveals to Dante the soul's full identity. Um, and then this other soul who's called out uh, names a string of other Florentines, particularly, who are frozen round and about. Um, they're a mixture of Guelphs and Ghibellines that have been involved in the Italian war. And for us as readers, it gives a sense of moving from the personal treachery, which we'd encountered, say, between um, the brothers who killed each other, to a more expansive sense of, of social treachery. You know, how civil war is so terrible because it can drag everybody down in a kind of vortex of hate and um, revenge. And, but it has this extra quality down here of being Faustian. It's as if um, this whole um, city-state, this whole moment um, of civilization began to will its own descent. Um, it says, you know, we will give up our souls for power and for the chance to defeat our enemies. Um, that is the seriousness that we're encountering now. And it, it's doubly resonant now because it's sometimes said that we live in a Faustian age that's willing to give up. Um, its soulful life, its connection to the spiritual world and the divine, in return for an increase of material and technological power. Um, you know, sometimes scientists even say this. They say, be careful what you wish for, because the desire for more and more power, more and more seemingly control over material and biological life, um, can turn against itself. Um, because we get a narrow view of things and so miss the wider picture in this rabid desire, which can also be understood through the ideas of systemic psychology, just developing this collective sense of how people can drag each other down. Because as systemic insights show, nothing binds people more tightly together than becoming engaged in acts that either make life or take away life. Um, you know, perhaps the making of life um, is obvious or more obvious because the making of life is the creative passion, the love, the desire to produce, to expand one's sense of vitality. Um, but the converse happens when souls or societies become locked together um, in the desire to take away life as well, um, that has quite as powerful a binding effect. Um, you see it at one level, say, on intergenerational trauma, where um, one generation that's been caught, say, in civil war, um, subsequent generations will suffer as well. Um, they'll have kind of compensatory symptoms if secrets, say, from the Civil War haven't been fully told, or if perpetrators have gained 
from strife that then subsequent generations benefit from, um, say, materially at one level, um, but suffer from um, psychologically, and that is another. Um, and I think that there's something of that going on down here in this region of hell as well. And we're getting a sense of how widespread um, this can become when it's left unchecked, when it's left untalked about. Um, and then it makes you wonder even about the civilizational echo here that Dante might have in mind. You remember the old man of Crete way back in the earlier regions of hell and how his name was invoked. Um, the old man of Crete who had been made of silver and gold um, had drawn on the richness of earlier civilization but now was leaning on um, his terracotta foot that was crumbling away beneath him. You know, this was a civilization that couldn't anymore see its glories, its richness, its true spirit, its true vitality in life, and instead it become locked into its weakest parts that were also going to be its undoing. That now is becoming evident to Dante's eyes. What can happen when a civilization itself turns from the divine light and consumes itself in the willful desire for power, for control, for mastery. The canto draws to a close with a particularly foul image of this. Dante sees two more souls, their heads are locked together and they're biting at the base of each of their opponent's necks, um, half cannibalizing each other. I think it's um, an echo of St Paul's remark in Galatians that be careful you don't bite your neighbour because you'll end up eating each other. That is being acted out down here. Dante turns to, the, to these two souls and says that he will tell their story if they'll speak to him. Um, but he'll do it only if his own tongue doesn't dry up first. Dante, the pilgrim, is himself unwittingly showing that he is at risk, he may die before he lives to tell this tale. Um, he has been seen as a living soul in hell, but now that he's totally immersed in the state of the souls around him at this low point, as the descent must risk, he too could die before he returns, before the turnabout comes towards an ascent. That is the real risk of this journey, and it's the risk that Dante, the poet, leaves us contemplating as he ends Canto 32, right out in the middle of the icy lake.